live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Tonight, San Antonio police released body camera video from a deadly shooting involving two officers last month. So that shooting happened May 19th on La Cantera Terrace. That's on the northwest side. So now we're going to walk you through this video. It begins with the officers parking their vehicle behind an allegedly stolen vehicle. According to the police department, the officers thought it was stolen because their license plate reader notified them that that vehicle was stolen. The two officers then get out of the car. They start walking around the apartment complex. They were originally there for a drug related call, but there you saw it almost a minute into the video. The officers notice the suspect get into that allegedly stolen car. They start running toward that suspect. Then you saw that car jump the curb there. The officers fired several rounds into that car and the video ends with officers breaking the window of that vehicle. Important to point out here, the video was edited before SAPD released it to KSAT. Yeah, so that suspect, by the way, has been identified as 21-year-old Angel Cuevas. He later died at the hospital. The two officers are Travis Maxwell and Daniel Garcia. Both had been with SAPD for eight months when that shooting happened last month. The Bear County District Attorney's Office is now investigating. There was an inmate overflow at the Bear County Jail. The Sheriff's Office went to Commissioner's Court today to explain why they have shipped out 150 inmates to neighboring counties. Yeah, the Sheriff's Office wants to continue to do that, so it's, it's asking the court for $4 million. Now, Commissioners today said no, at least for now. Courtney Friedman now tells us why. It's no secret the jail fills up faster during the summer, but Bear County commissioners like us did not know what the sheriff's office was already doing about it. Did not know that the jail was already shipping out these inmates to these counties. BCSO explained in commissioner's court they were dangerously close to going over the 5,075 inmate capacity. The state recommends jails top out at about 90% capacity, yet it recently got to 99%. So at that point, the sheriff exercised his prerogative to reach out and say, look, can somebody take these because we will be out of compliance. BCSO said they're transferring 298 inmates to other prisons. 150 have already been sent, 30 to Kerr County and 120 to Burnett County. BCSO's proposal showed for a full year of transporting inmates, they'd need over $4 million. Burnett County charges $80 per day per inmate, and Kerr County charges 65 Without a deeper understanding of how long the jail will be at capacity, they suggested funding it for 90 days and then reevaluating. I'd like to just make it a month-to-month -month type process until we get a clearer picture of what your jail population and then the big picture question, what caused the immense overflow? And did it have to do with the county's new booking system that's created some jams? I don't think we can singularly blame this on a technology migration. Those numbers were ticking up for some time. And so um, there, there's, I think, more here than that. BCSO wanted time to break that down, so the court awaits the update. Commissioners also requested more notice in the future when the jail starts filling up. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. I'm in jail. I'm not in jail. Tonight, a 15 year old is in SAPD custody after police say he killed his own mother. This happened around 2 this afternoon on Delgado Street, just west of downtown. Police tell us the teen shot his mom in the back of the head with a shotgun in a front yard, but they don't know why yet. The 15 year old did run from the scene, but was caught. The mother is said to be in her mid to late 30s. In a briefing about an hour and a half ago, the police chief told us there have been calls to that home before, but he didn't have specifics yet on why. Mm. And tonight, authorities in Blanco County are investigating a crash that killed a man and also sent several others to the hospital. That crash happened this morning on Highway 281 near Alamo Lane, which is north of San Antonio. The Department of Public Services says that a man driving a Camaro was going south when he veered into oncoming traffic and then hit two vehicles. Look at that wreck. The man driving the Camaro was killed. Two other men, one woman and three kids, were taken to the hospital. Right now, it's unclear why the man in the Camaro veered into the opposite lane.
This is a controversial fund that could help women cover the travel costs to access legal abortions outside of Texas. And San Antonio City Council members want it to roll out quicker. The half million dollar reproductive justice fund was approved in September as part of the current city budget. But City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us the fund might not actually get used until next spring. He's joining us now in the studio. Garrett, there have been so many questions about this fund. So what's the deal with it where it stands now? Well, abortion access is just one part of the Reproductive Justice Fund. It could also be ended up using, it could also end up being used for programs like sex ed, contraception, and even efforts to address food insecurity. But the opportunity for women to get help traveling out of state for legal abortions is definitely what's caught most people's attention, especially now as the city prepares to ask for proposals on how to use that money. Metro Health has set aside $200,000 specifically for what it calls downstream or immediate needs. That's where travel, that's where travel costs for out-of-state abortion would fall, along with needs like home pregnancy tests or subsidized doulas. But the timeline Metro Health laid out in a briefing today worried so some council members who are asking for proposals as soon as next week, but not getting contracts to council for approval until February and not starting those contracts until spring. When we budget something in fiscal year 2023, we hope that it gets spent in fiscal year 2023. And so it's frustrating to see an issue that's so important feel like it get dragged out. City staff said they would take a look at that timeline, but it's not clear how quickly they could actually condense it. And the council still split on using the fund to help with out of state travel. The three Northside councilmen in particular speaking against that particular use. Now, though no money's been awarded yet for anti-abortion, uh, no money's been awarded yet for the fund, anti-abortion groups have sued the city. They did that shortly after the Reproductive Justice Fund was included in the budget. A judge has dismissed the suit, but the groups have appealed the decision. In the newsroom, I'm Garrett Berger for KSAT 12 News. Stephanie, Myra. All right, thank you so much for that. Now we're yeah. gonna take you outside because you know we're watching for potential rain tomorrow. And I just wanna ask you, Adam, are we worried about flooding? Uh, you know, there could be some localized street flooding here and there, especially where the drainage is poor because debris has kind of clogged it up. But yeah, that's a potential. Right now, nothing to worry about this evening. You're just fine. You look at authority radar, nothing being shown at the moment. Just a few little spritzes and sprinkles possible in the coming hours. But most of the action is gonna be holding off until we get into tomorrow. And you look at the wider view and you see a big plume of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico moving in toward Houston and even some downpours headed toward Brownsville. This is all part of a bigger, broader system that stretches all the way down to Cancun and even the southern Bay of Campeche here in the southern Gulf of Mexico. And we're watching this area of clouds and you'll see you don't you, well, I should say you won't see <laughs> the green indicating rain any farther offshore because we don't have radar coverage out there. But there is showers, shower and thunderstorm activity in this area of clouds that I'm pointing out here. And this energy and moisture, that's what's going to be thrown our way along with adequate upper level support to kickstart showers and storms for us as we get through tomorrow. I don't think we'll wake up to much in the morning, eh, 20 to 30% chance, a few quick splash and dash light showers or sprinkles. But once we get into the afternoon, that's 70% chance of so the rain becomes more widespread. I'll be back to the future cast to help time it out for you and talk about where we're likely to see the most rain and accumulations in just a bit. Okay, thank you, Adam. And hopefully not a lot of people are gonna be on the road at, the at this time tomorrow when we get that rain. This is I-10 right now at the Y and you could see, I mean, kind of a typical situation here for six in the evening, but the area, the lanes that are leaving the downtown area, traffic is slow going in that area. We don't know exactly why, but you could usually assume that it's because it's just, you know, rush hour. There's also some construction just up the road there that's got traffic down to one lane. Eyewitnesses to a murder back in 2021 took the stand today in the trial of Andres Tarnava. He's accused of fatally shooting and burning the body of his ex-girlfriend, Mary Saul Klingelhofer. Her remains were found in a barrel in May of 2021. Two of her friends testified today that they were with her the night Tarnava allegedly showed up and shot her. And so I'm going to the, toward the truck. And when he was going toward the truck, I saw him pull out something, and it looked like a gun to me, so I got up and I ran. And that's when he opened and he shot it twice. He had the door open and he shot a couple of times. 
Yeah, it was probably about three or four times. Who did he shoot? Marisol, she was, taken, she was in the truck. They testified he then dragged her by the leg to his vehicle and drove off. Tarnava is facing up to life in prison if he's found guilty. His trial is on recess tomorrow and will resume Thursday morning. Tonight, President Biden is taking new executive action to protect hundreds of thousands of undocumented migrants from deportation. These new policies are expected to streamline the process to live and work in the U.S. One of those actions allowed undocumented spouses and children of U.S. citizens to stay in the U.S while they're applying for residency. Now, to be eligible, the spouses must have been here for at least 10 years. They also need to pass a background check. I refuse to believe that to secure our border, we have to walk away from being in America. For that's generations have been renewed, revitalized, and refreshed by the talent, the skill, the hard work, the courage, and determination of immigrants coming to our country. The second executive action would make it easier for undocumented migrants to get work visas. And yes, that does include DACA recipients. Those are the people who came to the U.S. as kids and are still undocumented. Now, tonight, Governor Greg Abbott reacting to the president's new executive action. In a statement, the governor says in part, quote, President Biden's mass amnesty will be another magnet to attract migrants to flood across our border illegally. President Biden needs to stop rewriting immigration law and start enforcing it. Happening later this week, we are getting answers to your questions about health care. And this week, it's all about the kids, child's health care. Scan this QR code to submit any question you have about your child's health. We'll take those to a local pediatrician who will join us for KSAT's Doc Talk. That airs every Thursday right here at 630. We also want you to watch out for this, something that's happening tomorrow night. KSAT and AARP Texas are holding a special conversation about Social Security. Trust me. It affects you. The people who depend on that program may get their benefits cut by 17 percent unless Congress does something. And this would affect the majority of Americans. Now, I'm going to be hosting the special. You could watch it at case on case at 12 tomorrow at 7 p.m. You can also watch it on our website, case at plus and on the case app YouTube channel. Still ahead here on the news at six. Will they stay or will they go? Why County Judge Peter Sakai and the county commissioners are trying to show the Major League Baseball that the missions belong in the Alamo City. Yeah, but first, let's take a live look outside with live cam. Look at that nice br blue, bright skies. But hold on, heavy rainfall is expected in San Antonio tomorrow. Meteorologist Adam Kasky is going to tell us how much we could get coming up. Conversations are starting about how money should be spent next year in the city's budget. So coming up tonight in the night beat, we're walking you through two top priority items, homelessness and affordable housing, and how the city right now is planning to spend some of the grants it's received from the federal government and what nonprofits have to say about it all. Okay, here's a big question. Could the San Antonio Missions baseball team be leaving San Antonio? If you ask the county judge, Peter Sakai, maybe, yeah. County commissioners today voted to authorize Sakai to create a letter of intent to show that Major League Base to show Major League Baseball that the county is working with the missions ownership group on a plan for a new stadium. The ownership group has identified a spot along the San Antonio or the San Pedro Creek rather near Fox Tech High School as a spot for a new stadium. And Sakai says he's willing to pony up some public funds for one. I'm not prepared today in any way to say that there is a contract that there are any firm details. Uh, we are optimistic that we can create a public-private financing uh, of a proposed stadium for the San Antonio Missions. Right now, the Missions play at Nelson Wolf Stadium, which is owned by the city. Judge Sakai says the team has an August 1st deadline with the Major League Baseball to show them that they're working with the Missions on a deal. All right, let's turn to the forecast now. Tomorrow was the day we have been watching for what could be some pretty significant rainfall, Adam. Yeah, some beneficial rain. You know, rain we're not so accustomed get to getting, right? A few inches here and there and more than a few inches, especially farther south of town. Now, we've been talking a lot about this little swirl in the southern Gulf of Mexico, the Bay of Campeche. We've been talking about that for a while. This has the potential to turn into a tropical storm. And if it what does, it have the name Alberta. We're talking maximum winds, 45 miles per hour, and all of that staying far south of Texas. So really, 
not much in terms of winds around here. Just a little bit of a breeze that you'll notice from time to time. Here's what's important with this. Notice how the moisture spreads all the way northward up to New Orleans. So the entire Gulf of Mexico here north south is just caked in this deep layer of moisture and upper level support. So it's not just about that little swirl in circulation that's getting all the attention because it might be a weak tropical storm. We are watching all this other activity and particularly this, the available moisture in the atmosphere. This really bright white color is deep, deep moisture in the air. We're talking from the ground all the way up to 30,000 feet. It's kind of like a really, really soggy sponge. And the soggier it is, the more water you can wring out. Well, that deep moisture, that's moving inland and it gets here tomorrow afternoon. It's no coincidence. Most of our rain will start tomorrow afternoon and then be intermittent tomorrow evening into tomorrow night until this deep moisture starts to get wrung out over the mountains of Mexico. So our main time frame for the most beneficial rain Wednesday afternoon on into early Thursday morning. Here's our future cast. It's in agreement with that tomorrow morning, maybe a stray sprinkle or brief shower, but very insignificant. The real showers will be spread apart and separated a bit and embedded downpours will exist, but they'll hold off in the morning, gradually move, move inland midday and early afternoon and become more widespread, especially around and a little before this time tomorrow. And it's not going to be continuous. There will be breaks in the action, but you will notice it for the afternoon evening commute tomorrow and even some leftover moisture for the morning commute on Thursday. And notice even as we get into Thursday, a little bit of activity lingering around and some redevelopment, just some tropical downpours popping up Thursday afternoon. We're not talking a severe weather threat here. No hail to worry about. No hail to worry about. The only concern is for some localized street flooding. That's our only concern. So something to keep in mind, especially in the typically flood prone portions of your commute or neighborhood. Something to keep an eye on. You look at the rainfall potential and there's going to be a huge variance north to south. Let's look at it this way. Along in north of Highway 90 will have lesser amounts. The heaviest rain will be south of Highway 90. Generally speaking, about two to four inches possible around San Antonio, four to seven from Crystal City to Catula to Beeville, Victoria, Goliad. So really soaker, especially farther to the south of town. But of course, your neighborhood is going to be dependent upon where those little embedded downpours just decide to pop up and how many of them you get. Bottom line, 70% coverage by tomorrow afternoon and evening. Thursday, we're at a 40% chance, so still scattered, widely separated, better than nothing. And then rain chances really fall off Friday and nothing around for the weekend. And actually the weekend looking pretty sunny and back to 90. Tomorrow, look at these temperatures. 82, the afternoon high, right? Say goodbye to the 90s. We'll be in the lower 80s tomorrow, mid 80s for high temperatures as we get into Thursday. And then sunny back into the 90s for the weekend. Coming up at 645, we'll talk about the potential storm surge along the Texas coast and more about these rainfall accumulations at 645. Okay, we'll see you then. Thanks, Adam. So during yesterday's game, I wondered if it was common for basketball players to chip their teeth. It happens a little more often than what you think because uh -huh. they take an elbow to the mouth or something, or in Derek White's case, you fall down face first on the floor and you're left with that, a busted tooth. But you know what? Winning certainly makes it feel better. And Josh Young is starting his rehab assignment with the Round Rock Express coming up. And that's just unfortunate for Derek White. It was one of the great trades that Brad Stevens engineered, getting him from San Antonio midway through a couple of seasons ago. Derek White has a banged up tooth, but he won an NBA championship in the process in big board sports. 
All right, so guard Derek White looks like he should be playing for the Boston Bruins instead of the Boston Celtics after suffering a chip tooth last night in Game 5 of the NBA Finals. It happened late in the second quarter while he was diving for a loose ball. His face hit the floor, and Mavs power forward Derek Lively, the second landed right on top of him. It was a brutal face plant that left White bloody and with a chip tooth. But as Spurs fans know, he's a tough dude, and he kept playing. During his championship winning presser, Derek talked us through that play. Dover the ball, lively landed on me, and I knew right away. I've chipped it in the past, and so it's not new, but like, I mean, this two's loose, the other two twos are wiggling, but um, they were trying stuff in the locker room. I was like, I don't care, just play. White finished with 14 points in game five last night to help the Celtics beat the Mavs 106-88 to wrap up the finals. The Spurs drafted White with the 29th pick of the 2017 NBA draft. And then in the 2021-22 season, the Spurs traded him to Boston for Josh Richardson, Romeo Langford, and a 2022 first round pick, which turned into Blake Wesley. Getting traded was a blow, yes, but now Derek White is an NBA champion. At the moment I got traded, I was I would say disappointed, but like, I mean, you're in San Antonio, like, that's just, that's all I knew. Um, but such a, such a blessing to be a part of this, this roster. Um, they just drive me in so many different ways from top to bottom. I'm just so thankful and grateful for each, of them, each and every one of them. And um, I mean, they made me a better player, made me a better person. And the city of Boston, everything has just been amazing for me. During his on-court interview, Derek said he'd lose all of his teeth for a championship, and that made the Boston crowd laugh and cheer. And this was the scene after the Celtics won their 18th NBA championship to break a tie with the Lakers for the most in league history. Thousands of fans flooded the streets around TD Garden in Boston as soon as the buzzer sealed the deal. The enormous sea of people filled Causeway and Canal Streets with some fans climbing onto police vehicles. The Celtics championship parade is set for this Friday. At the FIBA U18 Women's America Cup, the United States had no trouble today with Puerto Rico. First quarter, Ariana Robertson knocks down a jumper from the free throw line to make the score 25 to five Team USA. Moments later, the ball goes inside to Ari for two more points off the glass, and the U.S. led by 38 points at halftime. Third quarter, Ari down low, spins and scores. She had 10 points and 14 minutes ago with seven rebounds, two steals, and one block. And Team USA rolls. Yes, this score is correct. 102 to 22, improving the 2 0 in Group B play. Texas Rangers third baseman Josh Young started his rehab assignment with the AAA Round Rock Express Sunday. He went two for three with an RBI single in his rehab debut. Young has been on the injured list since the first week of the season after a wrist forearm fracture sidelined him just after the fourth game. Now the all-star third baggers on the comeback trail. Not a moment too soon with the Rangers nine games out of first place and six below 500. The Express are at the Sacramento River Cats tonight to start a six game series. Hey, thank you. Yep. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up next. Welcome back. Tomorrow we celebrate Juneteenth, a day of freedom in 1865 for enslaved blacks and African Americans right here in Texas. But it is a day that took years to actually mm. arrive in Texas. To explain the history and the significance of Juneteenth, we are joined by Lisa Jackson from the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum, or SACAM. Lisa, always great to see you. Thanks for sharing some time this evening. So let's thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about what what is Juneteenth? What are we celebrating tomorrow? You know, we're celebrating the emancipation of those Africans who were enslaved in America. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln did uh, put out the Emancipation Proclamation, but we were in the war. And of course, the Confederate States didn't recognize that. And it wasn't until June of 19, excuse me, of 1865, when General Granger landed in Galveston, that the slaves in Texas were freed. And the t slaves in Texas were the very last slaves in America to be emancipated. And that's why Juneteenth is celebrated all across the country as the end of slavery. Now, could we, you just mentioned that they, uh, the Galveston connection there. Is, a, is there a San Antonio connection in particular to this holiday? Well, we had slaves in San Antonio. You know, a lot of people don't realize that. When they think of slavery, they think more of the deep south of Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, and they kind of leave Texas out. 
But East Texas is where the cotton and the rice grew. So they have a large slave population. And Bear County in particular had a slave population that's well documented. Yeah, we're actually, I know uh, Jesse Degollado has shared some stories about how the yeah. missions played a role in yeah. helping, you know, enslaved people escape to freedom. You know, yes. you know people, people think of the Underground Railroad as going up north, but yeah. that doesn't make sense. Why would you travel up north when you can just go south to Mexico and you were emancipated? You know, Juneteenth, it's only been a federal holiday for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has only been something federally recognized for a few short years, obviously celebrated within communities, though, for, for centuries. So why is tomorrow so important? Well, tomorrow, it, well, tomorrow is Juneteenth. So we're going to celebrate <laughs> the, the emancipation of the slaves on Juneteenth. And, you know, the holiday is filled with uh, um, recollection. Uh, a lot of times it's filled with genealogy. It's a time for us to come back and remember our ancestors who were enslaved and who were freed. And we mark the holiday with parades and with barbecue and with family and entertainment. So it's really a day of rec uh, recollection and celebration. And it, can you talk about how San Antonio specifically is going to mark these events yeah. tomorrow? Well, San Antonio has more, this uh, because Juneteenth was it's on a Wednesday this year. Mm -hmm. uh, they celebrated this past weekend with a march and with the barbecue and a lot of other activities. There was a block party at Crockett Park and all throughout the month. There's been some celebration uh, of Juneteenth. But tomorrow you'll get a fireworks display at the end of the night. And if you would like to attend the um, all day celebration at Second Baptist Church, they're having theirs. And then Byron Miller is having his annual golf tournament at the Hilton Hyatt. So there'll still be activities specifically on June 19th if you'd like to celebrate. Where are the fireworks happening? They're at True Vision Church on Ackerman. And I've got to say Ackerman because they have two different locations. So that tops off the evening. That's their annual fireworks display. And it's beautiful. So I, I know that we have the San Antonio African American Archive and Museum, SACAM, here in San Antonio. You guys have yes. a huge expansion that is underway. You're moving to a much bigger location right now. For the last couple of years, you've been in La Vida. What is the mission yes. of SACAM? What do you all provide in this community? Well, you know, we're here to collect, preserve, and share the cultural heritage of African Americans in the Bear County and San Antonio region. And you all have done that over the years. One of, one of the coolest ways I think you do that is by collecting uh, your history harvest, oral histories, yes. people coming yes. in and just talking about their experiences, their memories. Yes. And you all do that every single year? We do it every single year and we do it throughout the year. It's called our History Harvest and we're in various locations throughout San Antonio. And we'd love for you to come in and share your family history or your memories here. We want to have somewhere to collect and preserve those things so that future generations can understand what it was like to be an African-American in Bear County. Now, if somebody has uh, um, a connection to a relative in, in Bear County, uh, you know, from, from centuries ago, I'm just wondering if people can go to your museum to get more information about really their family history. Well, you can go to the SACAM Museum to see the history of all African-Americans, and you might find a history of your ancestor in our archives. But you can also go down to the Bear County Clerk's Office and check their records. Because if you're doing genealogy, you know, slavery was just like buying a house or buying a car or anything like that. You had to have a deed. So there are uh, records in the Bear County Clerk's Office um, that show those transactions. Do you think that the, again, you know, with the federal recognition of Juneteenth, there has been more awareness that's grown out of yes. that these past couple of years? Yes. What has changed in the last couple of years in terms of what you see people know about this holiday? I see a lot more inclusion. I think people were under the misconception that uh, Juneteenth was just strictly an African-American holiday when Juneteenth is, in fact, an American holiday. And I see much more inclusion. I saw that on plenty of the floats and the different people attending the events this year. And I was very excited to see that. This is an American holiday. It's not just for African-Americans. It's a celebration of emancipation, but it's also a celebration of uh, America's emancipation from chattel slavery. I can't think of a better way to end our segment than right there. Thank you so much. Not just African-American Thank history, you. American history. Thank you so much. American for that. history. Yeah. Have a good time celebrating tomorrow. I know that we have a list of events. If you haven't had a chance to take part, we've got those listed on our website, ksat.com. Lisa, great to see you. And hopefully we'll great talk to again see soon. You again.
Thank you. All right. Take care. We'll be right back. We have an update tonight about a major water problem we've reported on here today. The water is back on now at three apartment complexes. Now that SAWS says the landlords at those complexes have paid their water bills. It's a story we followed throughout the day. SAWS shut off the water to at least four apartment complexes because of those past due bills. Now water is supposed to be included in the tenant's rent. However, SAWS told KSAT just before six o'clock that payments have been made and service has been restored at all but one of those complexes. Complexes. Together, Saws says that the unpaid bills totaled more than a quarter million dollars. Another news now with scorching temperatures on the way for much of the country. 265 million people are bracing for 90 degree heat or even hotter. Meantime, out west, they're dealing with some wildfires out there, plus the hot and dry conditions. ABC's Jacqueline Lee reports from Los Angeles. Summer hasn't even officially arrived, but parts of the U.S. could face its hottest stretch of weather in three decades. Heat alerts have been issued for 20 states from Missouri to Maine. It is almost unbearable. New York City may experience a five-day heat wave with temps above 90 degrees. New York's governor activating the National Guard with some schools getting out early. When you have this hot, humid weather, slight exertions make it really difficult on these kids, and they're little. And the city opening 500 cooling centers, but in Beltsville, Maryland, people sweltering inside their condos with broken oh, ACs. We need air. And in the West, firefighters racing to contain wildfires that continue to spread among gusty winds and hot temps. An hour north of Los Angeles in Gorman, crews have made progress on the post fire, which erupted on Saturday. And in New Mexico, just south of Albuquerque, another fire forcing more than 7,000 to evacuate. With extreme heat, the number one killer when it comes to weather, dozens of groups are asking FEMA to declare heat emergencies as major disasters. Jacqueline Lee, ABC News, Los Angeles. I feel for the people up there, too. You know, by the way, schools don't let out until the very end of June, usually around the East Coast, so that's why it's a problem. And most schools up there are older buildings, so they don't have central AC. Air conditioning. They do not have that. Well, we're going to get a break from the heat here tomorrow, hopefully with this rain, Adam. Yeah, the rain will give us a big break from the heat and the clouds, really, just for the next couple of days, a combination of the two. Highs in the low to mid 80s. I have, to, I have to catch myself because I almost just say 90s rolling off the tongue, right? Or near 100, but no, no, no. Low to mid 80s. Turning rainy tomorrow afternoon. Some intermittent showers with embedded downpours. Amounts will vary significantly. Localized street flooding is possible. We're going to dive into the details and even talk about the storm surge potential along parts of the Texas coast in a few minutes. All righty, welcome back, and we're really uh, focusing on what's going to happen tomorrow. Although tomorrow morning, Adam, you said might not be as much of an issue, right? Oh, no, tomorrow morning is going to be fine. Yeah, no issue tomorrow morning, and even limited issues tomorrow afternoon and evening. Just rain, you know, that's the topic, rain. We haven't been able to deal with a lot of rain lately, so it's good to have this back in the forecast and the potential for some street flooding, of course, whenever we get heavy rain around here. We have that flash flood threat, but no severe weather expected. This is good tropical moisture. Now, speaking of tropical, with a big onshore flow, the wind's moving in off the ocean at a pretty good clip. We're talking 20 to 30 miles per hour tomorrow. There is a storm surge threat along the Texas coast, and that's about one to three feet. The water could be above the normal tide. So typically not problematic, except for some of the very low line beachy locations that um, have issues at the very high tides because the water level could be one to three feet above the normal tide. That's because of that strong onshore flow. Now the actual potential tropical cyclone, I'll just be honest with you, I hate that name, potential tropical cyclone. It's a new thing from the Hurricane Center over the past few years. Aren't they all potential tropical cyclones? Anyway, so they're just waiting to give this a name. It would be Alberto. It's going to stay to the south of us. So you can basically just, for our purposes, ignore anything tropical storm related, assuming this gets the name Alberto in the coming hours or the coming day. The impacts aren't going to really change for us. It only could change if 
this for some reason just became really organized and drew some of the moisture south. That's the very low end possibility. But even look at the spaghetti plots and it stays south of Brownsville, parts of eastern Mexico with maximum winds of 45 miles per hour. We get stronger winds from cold fronts than 45 miles per hour. What really counts for us is what's really an inverted trough. You know how we often talk about the dips in the upper level flow? It's an upside down dip that's in the Gulf of Mexico and a lot of moisture with this here. South of New Orleans, toward Cancun, and especially eastward, even closer to Cuba. And all this whole area is just deep tropical moisture and upper level energy that's heading our way and going to be impacting us and giving us our showers and thunderstorms. Not in the morning, morning commute, we're going to be okay. The rain's going to be along the coast. It's once we get into the afternoon and the evening commute tomorrow, you'll notice some slowdowns and there's always a few issues. And with all the construction on our roadways, road flooding becomes more prominent because of that construction. We all know those construction zones. I 10 to I 35 along 1604 and so many other places that have those uh, drainage issues and notice we'll have the intermittent showers tomorrow afternoon into tomorrow evening and tomorrow night with embedded downpours and the exact amounts of rain will really depend upon where those embedded downpours just decide to pop up. But right now odds favor the highest accumulations south of Highway 90. You'll see a big difference in accumulations and potential north to south across Texas and especially our area is going to be a pretty tight gradient. We could see only one to two, say for Bolverde up to Austin and uh, Blanco, roughly two to four in some neighborhoods around San Antonio, but four to seven inches possible farther to the south. Check this out. 82 tomorrow, 86 on Thursday. Then we're back into the 90s. That's once we get into Friday and especially this upcoming weekend. So those rain chances increasing throughout the day tomorrow. That's the key increasing. The morning is going to be fine. The afternoon evening commute. That's when we can have some issues on the roads. Good to know. Thank, Thank you, Adam. You. The buzz is up next. In the buzz today, Team USA has unveiled its 2024 Olympic uniforms. Ralph Lauren decide, designed the outfits that athletes will wear throughout the games in Paris. The brand says the collection drew inspiration from the vibrant host city while embracing a patriotic spirit. So for the opening ceremony, Team USA is going to wear a classic navy blazer. There it is with red and white detailing paired with a striped Oxford shirt navy knit tie and tapered light denim jeans. The closing ceremony outfit features a race car, a race car style jacket with a USA patch detailing, a classic striped polo and white jeans. Kind of has a 90s vibe. Yeah, today. it does. I mean, I'm, I'm here for it, though. I like it. Now, after months of repairs, NASA's Voyager 1 space probe back on track. Last week, the agency said the spacecraft had resumed its mission of gathering information about the universe. This comes after the Voyager 1 started sending back corrupted data last November. Engineers eventually tracked the problem to a chip in the spacecraft's flight data system. The Voyager 1 is now more than 15 billion miles away from Earth. That's wild. It was launched in 1977, so it's now the longest operating and longest traveling spacecraft in history. Voyager 1 travels roughly 1 million miles per day. We'll, we'll be, be right back. Uh, good old Shabuzi. Love that name. Love <laughs> that fan. name. I just love the name. I mean, I like to say it. Yeah, I've heard some of the music. <laughs> I just don't remember exactly what songs yeah. or what song is Shabuzi's big one. Just love the name. <laughs> right? 25th. All right, take a look at a few isolated showers popping up. We'll have some of these into the night, but keep in mind we've got sunshine in between them. The real rain's going to be holding off until we get into tomorrow evening or tomorrow afternoon, I should say into tomorrow evening and tomorrow night and then some pop up redevelopment here and there on Thursday throughout the day. Sunny dry weekend. Now I'm just saying Thank that you. over and over again. Shabuzi. Exactly. See you on the night. Jelly roll. <laughs>